Good morning. Uh, <coughs> an honor to be here uh, back in Riga. My presentation uh, today will focus on uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 of uh, United Nations Guiding Principles on uh, Business and Human Rights. As uh, Gabriel already noted, uh, UNGP on Business and Human Rights are one of the main documents in Business and Human Rights. They set uh, expectations for both companies and uh, states uh, in Business and Human Rights. And I'm particularly happy that uh, today we have this conference in, uh, in Latvia and Riga also to build capacity on business and human rights in a, in a country and hopefully also leading towards a, a national action plan on business and uh, human, uh, human rights. So let me walk uh, through uh, the basic pillars of UNGPs on uh, business and human rights. Uh, the, first pillars, the first pillar concerns uh, state duty uh, to protect uh, uh, human rights. The second is on a corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and the third one is uh, access to remedy. Uh, I should note that uh, UNGP on business human rights uh, were adopted in June uh, 2011 by uh, United Nations uh, Human Rights uh, Council, which is an organ of uh, General Assembly of uh, United Nations, and they were adopted uh, unanimously, uh, and they were drafted by, by late Professor John, uh, uh, John Rogge. So let us uh, concentrate on the, first the nature of a UNGP on business human rights. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, UNGP on business human rights are soft law document, but as uh, John Ruggie always has uh, stated, uh, they include uh, already existing binding international rules on the business and human rights. So one can say they are soft law with uh, hard law contents, and one can also make argument that they are former and material source of international law. Uh, as far as binding or non-binding, perhaps this is discussion is not so important. Uh, what is important is the content, what do they, uh, do they say. So let us uh, look at uh, first at the first pillar, state duty to, to protect. Uh, this is a pillar which says what countries have to do in business and human rights. And uh, the most critical uh, two principles in this regards are uh, principle one and principle two. Uh, foundational principles which say that uh, states have a duty to protect human rights in a business sector. That means that they have both negative but also positive obligations in uh, human rights. And they should also state expectations uh, for businesses uh, in order to respect uh, uh, human rights. What is really uh, important is that uh, states should, uh, through national action plans or through regulatory environment, uh, you know, also to, uh, to provide a framework for business and human rights. And of course, a uh, state uh, can make an example you know, uh, of uh, respecting business and human rights uh, by first requesting its own, uh, meaning state-owned enterprises where the state has a capital investment to ensure uh, uh, business and human rights uh, standards. Perhaps uh, the most textbook example of a good practice here is uh, a Norwegian uh, state pension fund, uh, which really put emphasis on respect on business human rights also when choosing uh, capital investment. Uh, then, of course, uh, states have to pro provide a state oversight of, uh, over businesses. Here, of course, this is obligation of conduct, it's not obligation of, uh, uh, of, a, of a result, and also ensure that businesses uh, respect uh, human rights in their, uh, in their uh, operation. Uh, it's quite uh, important also to know, to know that uh, UNGPs were adopted in 2011, but in a way they already envisaged uh, what has been happening in Europe since uh, February 2020. Principle 7 is very critical uh, in this regard because it says that uh, states should uh, you know, make guidance for companies to operate in uh, conflict-affected areas ensuring heightened due diligence. You know, this is critical for businesses which uh, operate in, uh, in Russia, Ukraine, or Israel, uh, and occupied uh, Palestinian uh, territories. Uh, it's also important that state institutions you know, are very coherent in uh, engineering and propelling business and human rights standards, and that all departments you know, from executive, legislative, uh, and judicial brands, uh, they are on board uh, with these business human rights uh, standards because often in many countries we see discrepancies uh, between one ministry and another. A textbook example is now, uh, for example, uh, uh, a disagreement between the German Ministry of Finance and German Ministry of 
foreign affairs, which have totally contrary position on the new forthcoming directive on uh, corporate uh, uh, sustainability and due, uh, due diligence. Uh, and it's also quite important to ensure policy coherence in relations with foreign investors and policy coherence uh, uh, when states act within uh, international uh, organizations. So this is the uh, pillar, pillar one. Here are the main takes from pillar one. Of course, there's a lot of uh, debates uh, whether those obligations of states uh, apply only territorially or they apply also extraterritorially. Uh, what is the nature of uh, uh, such obligations? You know, whether the states also have obligations to uh, protect, fulfill, which are more positive. Uh, uh, of nature, and uh, it's also quite important, you know, to ensure uh, when those standards are adopted and implemented, that states also ensure measuring and supervision. You know, measuring is super important in, uh, in business and, and human rights. After those, uh, you know, states adopts uh, uh, those commitments and national action plan, uh, it has to adopt national legislation to implement. Uh, commitments for national action plan. But since 2011, uh, developments have been quite uh, you know, varied across the, the globe. Here you can see a map which was prepared by uh, Daniel Morris, colleague of uh, Gabriel. Um, uh, you can see in the, in the blue color uh, countries, or in green color countries, which have already adopted national action plan to imp implement UNGPs on business and human rights, uh, mostly in, in Europe, here in Baltics, uh, uh, it is uh, only Lithuania, uh, which uh, so far uh, ad adopted uh, beyond Europe. Uh, there are some good examples from Southeast Asia and uh, from uh, Latin, uh, Latin America. So about 30 countries so far adopted national action plan to implement UNGPs on business and, and uh, uh, human rights. And the national action plans, uh, you know, they have quite uh, a few positive uh, impacts. You know, they can create uh, incentive for adoption of legislation, they can clarify state and corporate obligations, uh, they can also build capacity in state institutions, uh, because mostly national action plans are soft law documents, you know, where the state uh, says what it, it will do in the next five uh, uh, to ten, to ten uh, uh, years. But of course, uh, uh, some good examples from national action plans uh, uh, from different countries in France, Germany, Norway, and UK, they have led to adoption of domestic legislation, uh, uh, due diligence guides in some uh, countries, and some national action plans. They have measurable indicators where we can see whether the state has implemented uh, what it promised uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the plans, uh, such as uh, Luxembourg, Slovenia, in Switzerland, and other countries. Uh, there are some weaknesses. Uh, from commitment issues to accountability, uh, accountability issues. But let us move on to the second pillar, which says that companies you know, should respect uh, business and human uh, rights standards. Uh, those are principles from 11 uh, onwards. Uh, the NGPs the talk about should, uh, and uh, at least in academia, this has been you know, uh, uh, a food for discussion since their adoption, because many of uh, my colleagues have uh, been criticizing John Raggi because he did not include shell, uh, but included uh, should. But nonetheless, uh, uh, the principle 11 uh, says that companies should uh, respect uh, uh, human rights. And which human rights, internationally rec recognized uh, human rights, those which are included in the eight uh, uh, UN, United Nations uh, human rights uh, conventions. And of course, uh, Concerning corporate uh, responsibility to respect uh, human rights, uh, there has been a lot of uh, discussions also under negotiations for the new EU directive to which companies uh, you know, those obligations should apply to all companies, you know, to a, a company which has one person employed or only to the largest companies. And uh, Raggi took an approach of all companies. Uh, EU legislation has different you know, uh, thresholds from 250 German law from beginning of this year. It applies uh, to 1,000 companies which have 1,000 uh, employees. So there are different approaches here, but UNGPs take very broad, very broad approach. And uh, principle 15 is also important. It uh, requests companies to introduce the processes and policies uh, in, the, uh, in their business, uh, business uh, operation. And what, are, what is really important are the uh, 
<laughs> operational operation principles. Uh, this is uh, these are tools how the companies uh, uh, introduce uh, human rights in their business. Uh, uh, processes. The first way is to, to adopt a, a policy commitment, a, a policy statement. And what is really important, what is, uh, at least in my opinion, added value of UNGPs on business human rights is principle 17, which uh, requests uh, companies to introduce due diligence uh, uh, processes uh, in their business operations. It's, it's a kind of uh, quality assurance systems in order to ensure that company does not uh, violate human rights. I'll come to that in a, uh, in a minute. Uh, it basically requires companies to, to integrate uh, data into business policies also, and also to supervise the impact and then act on it you know, to adopt uh, measures to, to uh, ensure uh, that uh, human rights risk will be minimized and, uh, 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 and reduced. Uh, and of course, um, when you talk about principle, uh, 17, uh, here you can see the quote from there. It's, it's about, you know, first uh, identify the risk uh, in a company's business operation and then, uh, you know, adopting policies which will lead to uh, reducing those risks and then getting data from, you know, different stakeholders within the company but also external stakeholders and then uh, drafting, uh, drafting uh, policies. Here, just to show you, uh, a bit uh, more clearly, it's a, it's a graph from uh, OECD. Uh, here, there are different phases of uh, due diligence processes. First step is to embed uh, responsible business uh, conduct uh, into business operations. Then, uh, secondly, to identify and assess adverse impact. Then, uh, uh, try to you know, minimize the risk, cease, prevent, uh, 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 mitigate impacts, uh, track. And then, fifthly, communicate uh, with external uh, stakeholders. Here, it's very important that the company is, uh, is very, it's very open and it doesn't hide information that, of course, could conflict with uh, business confidentiality, you know, which is an important principle in uh, conducting, conducting <coughs> business. But, for example, uh, Norwegian transparency law uh, requests that uh, any company which uh, has, not, has more than 50 employees has to share the information about uh, how they do diligence with the public, with NGOs, with civil society, which is quite, uh, yeah, it's a broad requirement. And it will take a lot of businesses, uh, uh, quite a lot of effort to adopt to this, to this um, uh, requirement. And then uh, sixth uh, step is basically provide uh, for or cooperate. And this uh, can be done in different steps, either the company, you know, provides for internal grievances, uh, you know, procedures, so that uh, rights holders, in a case of alleged human rights violation, they can turn first to the company, or they can go to you know, ombudsman mechanism, or they can go to any other governmental me mechanism. For example, here in Latvia, uh, you have uh, OECD national contact point, which is uh, active in this regard, uh, and it ensures that uh, uh, Latvian companies uh, respect OECD guidance for multinational uh, enterprises, uh, or you can go to any other mechanisms established in private sector. Many industries, for example, a diamond industry has uh, its own private uh, regulation where victims and rights holders can bring their, uh, bring their complaints. So there are different ways how rights holders and victims can uh, uh, voice, um, voice their, uh, their concerns. But all, all of these uh, pillars, you know, pillar two and pillar two, their aim is to ensure this business and human rights is, uh, is embedded in the company, company uh, culture. In my mind, yesterday when I, when I was coming here, I was reading there was an interview in uh, one of the German uh, finance uh, newspapers, uh, Handelsblatt, and there was an interview with the uh, German Minister of Finance, Mr. Linder, and he said that Europe uh, uh, does not innovate and it, that it only wants to, uh, to, uh, to, to regul regulate. And that's, that's why he... He explained why his party blocked the negotiation process, but I, I'm not sure it's, uh, it's, it's only about regulation. It's basically, it's basically about changing the culture, how you do uh, uh, business, because it's, this is not really regulation. It's basically to ensure that all of us uh, here in Europe have a better quality of lives, that when we do work, uh, that we work under uh, uh, dignified conditions. Uh, and this, in a way, also leads to, you know, better self-fulfillment, which, you know, propels also innovation. So, uh, 
uh, one could also have a different view than Mr. Linder uh, on that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when we talk about difference between uh, uh, corporate and, and state, uh, state obligations and business human rights, uh, surely states have primary obligations to ensure that human rights are respected. You know, this is a usual tenant in, uh, in, uh, in human rights law that the states have negative and positive obligations. But then, uh, surely, uh, corporate obligations are, are, are complementary, they are secondary. And in a way, as uh, uh, Gabriele already noted, there is a move from you know, this negative, corporate, negative nature of corporate obligations to positive nature of corporate obligations that companies, it's not enough anymore that companies do not do harm, so they do not violate human rights, but uh, they, they also have to show that they respect human rights by conducting uh, due diligence policies uh, by uh, uh, introducing these quality insurance systems in their, their uh, uh, operations. Uh, just to, uh, to conclude, uh, perhaps uh, some of the lessons from other countries uh, in the develop um, development of national action plan, uh, business, um, uh, business and human rights, these processes in many different uh, countries have been very useful because they engage different stakeholders from business, government and civil society and they define actions and uh, also re expected uh, results and also they ensure the responsibility of, of uh, different, uh, different actors. But when, you know, when a country oh, takes a new path and adopts national action plan and, you know, sets promises and objectives, it's really important uh, that a country doesn't do that just for uh, you know, sake of window shopping, that national action plan also has a set of uh, measurable indicators where uh, you know, government, business and civil society institutions co can go back and after a few years measure what has been, has been uh, uh, done. And of course, uh, uh, nowadays, there's a lot of pressure from both from within the countries, but also from uh, regional and uh, global uh, global arenas that the companies uh, should adopt national plan, action plan of business human rights. This is something that, yeah, uh, uh, is, this is necessary in human rights in order to take, you know, respect and promotion of human rights forward, also in the business sector. So, thank you very much.